Uh, thank you all for coming here tonight. Uh, if we could get everybody to move down to the front row, I'd appreciate it. No, not really. Um, so I do uh, appreciate everyone uh, coming to this event. <coughs> I've done many town halls in, in the uh, short time I've been in, in Lansing, and um, I can't think of a more important uh, town hall than this one, uh, auto no-fault reform. If you own a car, you pay car insurance. And uh, if you get in an accident, that insurance uh, pays your medical bills. Um, but it's not a perfect system. And I get a lot of questions. And uh, I have to tell you, quite often we'll get phone calls in my office, um, people uh, that just got their car insurance bill. And uh, they call up and they say, well, my car I got my car insurance bill and it went up. So I called my agent and asked him why it went up, and the agent says, call your legislator, it's his fault, or her fault. And uh, I, you know, I have absolutely no idea how to respond to that, right? So, um, so this uh, issue has been uh, a hot button issue in Lansing for a long time, long before I've been there, and certainly ever since I have been, uh, I have been there. And um, like I said, everybody who has a car um, pays auto insurance. I pay for four cars. So yeah, ooh. So uh, it's it's uh, it can it can have quite a hit on your pocketbook, um, and we all want to make sure that we're getting the biggest bang for our buck and try to lower our rates. And so um, that's why I felt that this was so important to to have this event. And I do appreciate you all coming here tonight. So we're gonna have uh, it's it's a lively discussion. Uh, I've seen this discussion before, and and we have uh, t two sides of the issue uh, being presented. Uh, one side for auto no-fault reform, uh, the other side that uh, supports the current system that we have now, and they're both going to make excellent, excellent arguments uh, as to why um, uh, they feel there needs to be change or keep it the same. But before we do that, uh, we're going to have a, a brief presentation on the history of auto no-fault reform. Why do we have auto no-fault reform? Um, what did we have before that? How did we get here? And uh, I think a little bit of history as to why we have the uh, current system that we have now is uh, very important as we move on to the discussion of talking about uh, reforming the system as a whole. So um, I know we said uh, we were going to start at 6 o'clock, and, and uh, our friends from Lansing got to find out what uh, metropolitan Detroit traffic is like. And uh, I commute every day, by the way, guys, so I have no sympathy for you. Um, but, uh, and I bet you're glad your insurance has been paid up. Um, but uh, we're going to go ahead, and our first speaker uh, actually is a state employee from the Department of Insurance and Financial Services. Uh, it's Renee Campbell. And Renee is going to do a PowerPoint presentation. And then after she's done with that, I will introduce the rest of the panel. They'll come up on stage. They will be doing a presentation, and then we'll have time for Q&A after that. So thank you very much, Renee. Thank you for coming. My name is Renee Campbell, and I work for the Department of Insurance and Financial Services. I'm a manager in the insurance unit um, in the Office of Consumer Services. So um, I just want to start and give a, just a brief overview, very briefly, of our department, and then we'll move into a discussion of um, the history of um, no fault in the state of Michigan. So the Department of Insurance and Financial Services regulates Michigan's financial service industry. We are fee funded and we do not require public tax dollars to operate. Our mission in the state of Michigan is to provide consumer protection, consumer outreach, and education services to Michiganders and the industry in the state of Michigan. We regulate three different industries in Michigan. The insur insurance industry, which includes HMOs, insurance agencies, insurance agents, and insurance companies, as well as the consumer finance industry that includes debt management companies, loan officers, mortgage companies, motor vehicle sales finance uh, companies, payday loan companies, and then also our financial institutions industry, which includes state chartered banks and state chartered credit unions. So before I get started, one of our pet peeves in the industry is the use of the word PLPD. So this term existed prior to the implementation of the no fault law. Um, it no longer is an accurate term to use. I know a lot of 
um, individuals in the industry continue to use the term PLP, let me sell you a PLPD policy, which is not accurate for no-fault policy. So I just wanted to mention that. You won't hear me use the term. Um, we try to correct when we hear insurance agents call our office and use the term PLPD. We tend to correct them and say, that's not an accurate term. When we have consumers call our office and say, I bought a PLPD policy from my agent, we say, no, you did not. <laughs> you purchased no-fault insurance. So that's not an accurate term. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I was asked by my superiors to mention that at the presentation tonight. So let's get started and let's talk about no-fault insurance and its history. So what is no-fault? It is an insurance system that allows policyholders to recover financial benefits from their own insurance company. Financial benefits such as first party medical benefits, regardless of who is at fault for the accident. So in order to do that, or what allows them to do that in exchange for that, it also restricts the policyholder's benefit right to sue. So when we implemented no fault and we said policyholders, everyone goes back to their own, their own insurance company um, for benefits, we also said you no longer have as, as much right to sue another person. So that essentially is the no fault system. Prior to 1973, Michigan had a traditional tort system in place. So if you were injured in an automobile accident, you had to ascertain blame, you had to hire an attorney, and go to court. In Michigan's no-fault law, when it was adopted on October 1st, 1973, it was adopted essentially because of the poor performance of our tort liability system. There were long payment delays, there were inequitable payments, and there were high legal costs. Three objectives of the no-fault system. When we implemented the no-fault system, there were three objectives. One, to increase the level of benefits that were paid to injured persons, ensure prompt payment of benefits. So instead of being drawn out in the legal system, we wanted to ensure that benefits were being paid promptly. And we wanted to ensure affordability by reducing, reducing the proportion of premium dollars that were being paid out by the insurers for legal and administrative costs. Well, prior to 1973, it was estimated that approximately 69,000 auto injury lawsuits were being filed every year. So that was something that was also looked at at the time. Moving on, the, the Michigan, Catastrophic, Mich Michigan Catastrophic Claims Association, the MCCA, that's the acronym you're probably most likely to hear, the MCCA, was created by the legislature in 1978 and was formed as a private nonprofit association. So from 1973 to 1978, Auto no fault automobile insurers were paying claims as a result of the implementation of the auto no fault law. From 1973, for the first five years, automobile insurers, what they would do, no fault automobile insurers would go out and, and seek reinsurance, get a reinsurance policy to help pay their pay claims, help them pay claims um, for these catastrophic no fault policies. It became more difficult for the no fault automobile companies to get reinsurance. In response to that, the legislature enacted uh, the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Association. So essentially, the MCCA now provides reinsurance to its member companies for the payment of unlimited first-party medical benefits that are required under the no-fault law. Currently, the MCCA will reimburse no-fault automobile companies for uh, personal injury protection claims that are in amounts over and above $545,000. Each automobile insurance company that's writing auto insurance in Michigan is a member of the MCCA and the MCCA is financed through its assessments to their member companies. In 1980, the no-fault law reinstated a limited amount of tort liability. Most likely you'll hear this referred to as mini-tort. It gives an individual the, at that time it gave the individual, um, the ability to be sued or to sue for up to $400 in physical damage to their vehicle. At this time, the law has been increased to $1,000. So if you cause physical damage to another person's vehicle, that individual could then come after you for up to $1,000 in physical damage to their vehicle. In 1980, this change came about as a result of consumers complaining that they were being required to pay their collision deductibles when they weren't at fault for an accident. So this is commonly called mini-tort, and I'll talk a little bit more about this a little bit later in my presentation. So step back for just a little bit. In 1977, Catherine Shavers brought an action to the Michigan Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality 
of the Michigan No-Fault Law. In 1978, June of 1978, the court held that the No-Fault Law was constitutional and that it provides benefits to accident victims in lieu of having to bring a lawsuit. However, the court also determined that the rate-making mechanisms under the No-Fault Law, or under the law, were inaccurate. And it gave the legislature and the Commissioner of Insurance 18 months to um, remedy those deficiencies. So in response to that, Public Act 145 of 1979 was passed. This is commonly known as the Essential Insurance Act, or EIA for short. The Essential Insurance Act impacted auto and homeowners insurance in three different ways. Underwriting, rate making, and consumer rights and information. So I'll talk a little bit about each one of those things. Once the Essential Insurance Act was passed, insurance companies had to put their underwriting rules in writing. The underwriting rules have to be applied in the same manner to everyone. The factors for the underwriting rules that the companies used are stipulated in the law, they're outlined in the law. It also guaranteed access to auto and homeowners insurance to everyone as long as the applicant is eligible. And eligibility or eligible applicant is defined in the statute. The Essential Insurance Act also, eliminate, also eliminated prior approval of rates by the Commissioner of Insurance. So the insurance companies no longer had to get approval, had to file their rates and get approval before they could begin using them. Insurance companies, auto and homeowners insurance can now file their rates and begin using them um, without receiving approval. The law also stipulates, the Essential Insurance Act also stated that rates cannot be excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. Companies can now make immediate rate adjustments to keep up with market, market competition. And the law allows insurers to use rating territories to determine premium, meaning they can look at zip codes to determine rates. However, companies, consumers have the right to know the information upon which a company uses um, to determine a, a rate or an underwriting decision. So if there's been a decision to um, change your premium, a consumer has the right to ask for that information and the company has to provide that. Or if coverage has been denied, a consumer now has the right to ask for all the information that went into making that decision. Consumer also has the right to appeal a company's decision if he or she believes that it's improper. So going back to no fault, I'd like to talk a little bit about the three main components of no fault and give a little background on those, those components. You have personal injury protection, PIP, property protection, also known as PPI, and residual liability, bodily injury and property damage. So personal injury protection. This is one of the main components that we hear most often, most complaints about in our office. This provides first party medical benefits, unlimited medical and rehabilitation benefits for an individual, for a policyholder's lifetime. It also provides monthly, monthly work loss <clears throat> benefits payable for a maximum of period of three years from the date of the accident. If the policyholder or the individual that's injured in the accident passes away, it also provides a monthly survivor loss benefit payable for a maximum period of three years from the date of the accident. Those are currently both set at a monthly benefit of $5,392, and that's set to increase on October 1st of this year. Personal injury protection benefits also include replacement services of up to $20 per day for up to three years from the date of the accident. Replacement services typically include those things such as mowing your yard, maybe shoveling your sidewalk, um, going to the grocery store, things, things of that nature maybe that you aren't able to do as a result of your injuries that you sustained in the automobile accident. Also includes funeral and burial, burial expenses of at least $1,550. That's a minimum, ben minimum benefit, but no more than $5,000. Property protection insurance. This pays up to $1 million in damages that your car does in Michigan to another individual's property. This may include damages to a fence, um, a structure, a building, maybe your car accidentally runs into someone's home or building, things of that nature. It will also pay for damage your car does to another person's properly parked vehicle. So if you're backing out of a parking space, in a parking lot and you hit another parked vehicle, that type of situation would be covered under your property protection insurance. The individual's parked vehicle that you hit 
could claim their benefits under your property protection insurance. Residual liability uh, insurance, bodily injury and, and property damage. I talked earlier about no fault taking away the tort liability and that there, this residual liability insurance provides protection to you from being sued except in limited special circumstances. Those special situations are involve situ circumstances in which you cause an accident in which someone is killed, seriously impaired, or permanently disfigured. Or you're involved in an accident with a non-resident in Michigan who is also an occupant of a motor vehicle that's not, not registered in Michigan. You're involved in an accident in another state. Or the mini tort, where we talked about that earlier. You are you are um, cause physical damage to another person's vehicle of up to $1,000. Those, those circumstances I listed right there are situ situations in which you could be sued. Your no-fault policy would provide coverage to you up to certain amounts. And this is where you, your liability insurance comes into play. You'll often hear insurance agents refer to 20-40-10, $20,000, $40,000, limits. Um, you may have purchased higher limits on your policy, but your liability insurance will pay up to $20,000 for a person hurt or killed in an accident, up to $40,000 for each accident if several people are hurt or killed, and up to $10,000 for property damage in another state. Michigan's minimum limits for residual liability insurance for bodily injury and property damage are $20,000, $40,000, and $10,000. Those are the minimum limits. However, there are Many, there are some insurance companies in Michigan that won't sell those limits to you. If you ask for Michigan's minimum limits, you, if someone is wanting those minimum limits, they have to shop around and find a company that's willing to offer coverage at those minimum limits. What that means if you, sorry, if you purchase insurance at those minimum limits and you're involved in an accident, for instance, where you hurt or seriously kill, seriously kill, you seriously hurt or kill an individual, and there is a judgment against you, say, for $100,000, but you only carry $20,000, you'll be personally financially responsible for that difference of $80,000 because your, your liability insurance is only $20,000 and your insurance carrier will only cover you for $20,000. And that's why most, um, if you're speaking with an insurance agent, many insurance agents will encourage you to carry higher residual liability limits. So some optional coverages like I just spoke about, higher residual liability insurance limits. There is the mandatory no-fault coverage you carry, personal injury protection, property protection insurance, residual liability insurance. You can carry residual liability insurance limits higher than 20, 40, 10. Mini tort or limited property damage coverage, that's not a mandatory coverage. So that $1,000 we talked about where you could be held responsible for $1,000 in physical damage to someone else's vehicle if you're at fault. You can carry coverage on your, on your policy. It's not mandatory. Um, you can ask for it. Your agent might refer to it as mini tort or limited property damage coverage. You can carry that on your policy for an additional premium. Uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage, that's also an optional coverage in Michigan. And then, of course, collision coverage and comprehensive coverage. Those are also optional coverages um, on, your, on your policy. So then just to provide a, just some brief points, um, on no-fault coverage. A no-fault policy will cover all family members living in the same house. We get a lot of questions on this at our office, individual contacting DIP with, que with questions. PIP benefits are paid even if the family member in your household is a passenger in someone else's car. So maybe they're riding in a friend, you're, you're riding in a friend's vehicle and you get into an accident. Everyone goes back to their own no-fault policy first in the order of priority. If you're hit as a pedestrian, you'll still go back to your own no-fault policy first for benefits if you have a no-fault policy. We get a lot of questions on that. And a no-fault policy will also cover anyone riding in your vehicle that's hurt as a passenger if they don't have their own no-fault policy and they're not living in a household that has a no-fault policy. So if someone's a passenger in your, in your vehicle and there's an accident and they're injured and they have no other no-fault coverage, there's a good possibility they may be able to claim benefits under your policy. Um, same, same instance if they're, if they're hit as a pedestrian as well. Motorcyclists involved in an accident with a motor vehicle will receive pit benefits under the motor vehicle's no-fault policy regardless of fault as well. So that's, that's another question we get a lot in our office as well. 
And then I just wanted to let you know that this is just a brief summary of no-fault insurance, its history, and some of the parts of the no-fault policy. For more information, I would encourage you to take a look at your no-fault policy. If you have questions, talk to your insurance agent. Please feel free to call our office. DIFS is always here, ready and willing to answer questions. And then I also put some publications out front as well, including some shopper's guide to home and auto insurance, uh, a brief explanation of no-fault insurance. Our uh, telephone number and website are at the bottom there. DIFS is always ready and able to answer questions, and we would encourage them from you. And then the last slide provides all of our contact information, toll-free number, local number, website, and our mailing address. If you don't get a chance to write that down and you, and you want to, if you miss that, feel free to catch up with me at the end of the presentation. I'd be happy to provide that to you. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Renee. Well, now we're all auto no fault experts, aren't we? Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. So uh, next coming up uh, on the presentation, at this point, if you have any cards with any questions on there, we're going to be passing the uh, basket around. Um, so you can put your questions in there, and then we'll be uh, doing the Q&A after the presentations. Uh, but next coming up will be uh, Pete Kuhnmensch and Tom Shields. Pete represents the Auto Insurance Association of Michigan. Auto Insurers Association of Michigan, and Tom represents uh, CARE, which stands for Coalition for Auto Insurance Reform. So, uh, P Pete and Tom, and come on up. Uh, I think you, uh, Tom said that you were going to. And you, you have a presentation. Uh, I'm just gonna talk. You're going to talk. Okay, you're, right. you're wired for wired for sound. So, okay, Pete, Are go you ahead. I haven't happened. Okay, how's that? Well, after Renee's presentation, we all know about no fault insurance, right? I mean, the thing is, I've uh, my name is Pete Kuhnmensch. I'm the executive director of a group called the Insurance Institute of Michigan. I should start out there, and we represent the insurance companies that write auto here in Michigan: um, State Farm, Allstate, AAA. Those folks, are very common names that you know, all the way down to uh, uh, folks like Mi Northern Michigan Mutual insurance company from Hancock, Michigan. So uh, our members write oh, roughly 75 to 80 percent of the personal auto policies in the state of Michigan. And uh, I've been with the association for about 11 years now. Um, so um, I'm, I, I don't consider myself an insurance guy, but I represent the industry now. So um, what we'd like to do really is kind of make a case this afternoon to this evening for um, some changes to our no-fault system. And as, and as R Renee, I think, presented, um, we've got a pretty comprehensive, uh, really beneficial system, but it's a very complex uh, law with a lot of nuances to it. Uh, one of the last points she made up there was the, that motorcycles, when they're involved in an accident with a car, they claim against the car's policy. And we, we get a lot of those calls too, Renee, uh, about folks complaining that, well, wait a minute, I thought we were in a no-fault state. Why is this motorcyclist claiming against my car? Because that's not the theory behind no fault. The theory behind no fault is all we, we all self-insure, and we go to our own insurer when we get into accidents. Well, that's one of the anomalies in the law, and there's several of them out there that we can talk about. But um, you know, it, it's a very complex law with many moving parts. Uh, it can become a very emotional issue um, because of the, um, the severity of the accidents that we see in the auto insurance marketplace. Um, uh, but reform, we think, is very possible, and we think it's necessary. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, uh, about why we think it's uh, a requirement of uh, some making some changes here. Uh, Renee gave a good background that I'm not going to repeat about the history of the development of our no-fault system. Uh, we're one of 12 states that utilize a no-fault system for auto insurance purposes. There used to be 16. Uh, some of the states have moved away from our no-fault system, uh, Colorado, I think, being the most recent that decided to go back to a tort system, where if you're in an auto accident, you basically have to sue the responsible party for your benefits. Um, Michigan's the only unlimited benefit state of all the 12 no-fault states. In fact, uh, we can argue about the details, but uh, New York has a mandated PIP benefit of 50000 
Uh, I think it's Pennsylvania has 15,000, but then they have an optional $250,000 catastrophic coverage. So those are the those are the uh, states, the no-fault states, that are most near Michigan as far as mandatory benefit. We are the only state that has this lifetime unlimited benefit. So that explains some of the costs, but it's a it's a very um, beneficial system for the consumer. Uh, unfortunately, this unlimited lifetime medical benefit uh, didn't come with any checks and balances. Uh, we've got a system that uh, provides a, a wonderful benefit to the consumers, but we have uh, no mandated treatment protocols within the law. Uh, so if your doctor says you need it, you get it pretty much. Um, we've got a system, unfortunately, that has a provision in the law that was, I think, actually designed to contain costs. And what it says is, um, Health care providers can charge no-fault insurance companies and no-fault carriers only um, the same amount that they charge non-insurance payers. Now, if you think about that, it's kind of strange language, and I think back in 1972 when we enacted our no-fault statute, it made a lot of sense because if you walked into a hospital back in 1972, what you got charged was basically the same thing that everyone was charged. Um, what's transformed since that time is a huge cost shift within our health care delivery system. Medicaid came along and established a fee schedule. Well, the hospitals had to make up the difference because that was somewhat inadequate. Medicare has a similar fee schedule. In the mid-1980s, the state of Michigan passed a fee schedule, medical fee schedule associated with the workers' compensation insurance system. Um, and so what you've, what you've seen transpired is the Many of the payers under the health care system have these statutorily mandated health care uh, limits as far as the charges. Uh, no fault does not. We were, we, we were late to the party, if you will, with respect to trying to enact a fee schedule to help contain costs like all these other systems have done. So uh, combine the unlimited benefit with the basically um, you know, the, the, the wide open treatment protocol, if we, you will, uh, and the lack of a fee schedule, those costs are starting to catch up with us. And that's, that's why the industry is promoting changes to the no-fault system. Um, you know, what the, the current bill that's before the legislature, Senate Bill 248, it came out of the Senate and the House Insurance Committee and sits on the House floor. Um, that tries to enact some of these cost reforms. One of the things it tries to do is go after fraud. Another is it, it, it uh, adopts a medical fee schedule, similar to the work comp system. Um, it also tries to go after some abuses that we've recognized in attendant care delivery. And uh, what's the fourth component, Tom, I'm missing? Yeah, we, we talked about the fraud authority, attendant care. Oh, the MCCA. Um, the MCCA is what's called a reinsurance mechanism, and we're, you know, I think Renee mentioned that that was actually added about four years after the enactment of No Fault, because with the unlimited lifetime medical benefits, some of our smaller insurers, when they got more than a couple of these cases on their books, it began to threaten their financial uh, viability and their solvency. So the state stepped in and said, okay, we're gonna protect the smaller insurers, and we're gonna make everybody participate in this reinsurance mechanism called the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Association. And it, it did a good job of basically protecting the solvency of the companies. Um, and that's been in a place, as I said, since 1978, and that was, again, a state-mandated component of our no-fault system. So here we are, the only state with this unlimited medical benefit, and because of these kind of lack of cost controls, we're kind of facing the rates that we see today. Now, you know, in some areas of the state, it doesn't look too bad. We're, you know, depending upon what figures you believe, we're anywhere from the, the highest auto insurance uh, state in the union to the seventh highest. Uh, but the reality is it's, it, it's easy to understand because we've got the highest mandatory benefits uh, that are required of any insurer. I can't sell you a policy anything less than lifetime unlimited medical. The law doesn't allow it. So um, what we've tried to do with the reforms is try to address some of those things. One, adopt a medical fee schedule. Um, and we can argue whether or not you want government interfering with uh, you know, the private market, as it were. But government's already done that. They mandate that you buy car insurance. And they mandate that you can only buy an unlimited medical benefit. So 
our belief is that if it, the state government's going to mandate that benefit, then they ought to have a hand in trying to control those costs. Ergo, we have a proposed fee schedule. Um, the fraud authority just kind of makes sense to us. We're one of the, one of the uh, only no-fault states that has no centralized fraud authority in the state here in Michigan. So we've proposed a five-year pilot uh, to basically generate some revenue to help prosecute the fraud that we know is out there. And we'll have mandatory reporting by the companies for the first time so that we'll actually have a picture, a statewide basis of where the fraud is emanating from. And again, as I say, generate some funds to pay our local prosecutors and law enforcement agencies to go after that fraud. Because right now, it's not much of a priority for them. They have bigger fish to fry, if you will. So the fraud authority combined with that fee schedule, I think, will be, have a significant impact on the cost of auto insurance. Uh, the changes to attendant care is kind of a long-term fix to a, uh, a problem we've seen out there. And then the, uh, the change to, of the MCCA. Um, you know, there's been a lot of debate on that, and you'll hear more about it tonight relative to the, the MCCA um, being non-transparent and you don't know the numbers. Uh, I'd encourage you to go on your computer when you get home and go to www.michigancatastrophic.com. That's the MCCA's website. Uh, you can get their last three annual financial statements. Those are filings with the insurance department. It lists all their revenue and their expenses and uh, salaries, I think, for the top executives. And, uh, but what it also shows is every, every bit of investment that they've got reserved for these catastrophically injured folks. And recognize, even though there's uh, 18 plus billion dollars in that fund, that's designed to pay for the folks that are already injured. Not, not projecting into the future the new claims, but the folks that today have been injured in car accidents. And we've got, as companies, a legal liability to pay those claims for the rest of their lives under Michigan law. So as I said, the legislature kind of crafted this MCCA back in order to support the payment of those long-term claims. And basically what it did is socialize the cost of our catastrophically injured. Uh, all of you pay an MCCA charge on each insurance policy that you pay for, auto insurance policy that you pay for. Doesn't matter if your car is worth 5000 or 50000 you pay the same you know, $150 assessment today. Um, so that, that was by design with the legislature to try to even out those costs for everybody. But that's what it's designed for. It's designed to help pay for those costs and to protect the solvency of our insurance companies so that we've got insurers around. Um, you know, we talk about the escalating costs, and one of the things that I think really clearly demonstrates that is in 2000, the average auto insurance personal injury claim was $13,607, something like that, $13,600. Today, that same claim in 2014, the average PIP claim was over $46,000. We've seen such a ramp up of health care costs, and it's, there's a number of reasons for it, and we're not pointing fingers at anybody. It's just a reality that we face with health care. Number one, um, the no-fault system is more highly accessed than it's ever been in the past. Number two, you know, and I'm sure you've read about and heard all the debate on the escalation of health care costs across the board. We face that same thing. Unfortunately, with the... Uh, the little anomaly that I mentioned earlier about us paying uh, charges rather than actual, you know, fees that other people pay. Um, sometimes auto insurers are paying three, four, and even five times the amount for the same service. Um, we've got charts that demonstrate that across the board. Unfortunately, most of that's within the acute care arena, um, you know, where we might pay four or five times the amount for an, the same MRI that someone who might have fallen off their roof, roof and injured their back has versus somebody involved in an accident only because it was the result of a car accident. The injury may be almost identical, or the concern medically would be the same, but the charge, because of that anomaly in state law, boosts up our costs. And, uh, you know, somebody said something about sympathy for the insurance companies. Believe me, we don't get any, uh, but the point of the matter is when we have to pay two and three times the charges, our customers have to pay for that. So that's what we're trying to change here. Um, again, uh, th that's briefly what, what the reform legislation is doing, uh, Henry, and I, I know we want to keep people interested and not, not uh, uh, 
chase them away with boring insurance executives talking. But the last point I'd like to make is we also have another proposal before the state legislature, and it's being promoted by Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan. Um, and this would, for the first time, uh, give consumers a choice between either buying the current mandated unlimited benefit or purchasing a lower cost option, more similar to what you can purchase in other no-fault states. So um, that's been introduced in the Senate, and it came out of Senate committee, and it sits on the Senate floor right now. But that's also another option that the industry supports. Um, basically gives consumers the right to choose. You can decide how much life insurance you choose, how much you purchase. Even under the Affordable Care Act, you, you can buy a bronze policy or a silver policy or a gold policy. You have a choice on the level of benefits and the level of co-pays and things of that nature. So um, we'd like to give consumers the same choice under their auto insurance because lacking that choice, we're forcing basically all the costs onto the no-fault system that reasonably should be shared amongst other health care systems that are out there. I mean, why duplicate and insurance that you're always already paying for. And a perfect example is our seniors. Uh, they pay for their Medicare out of their pocket. They buy the, you know, the prescription coverage and things of that nature. Because the Medicare program is mandatory secondary, or p secondary payer, what that means is you don't access Medicare until any other mandatory health insurance is expended. Well, in Michigan, your no faults never expended. So you never can rely on your Medicare to help pay for your auto insurance claims. And that boosts up, up the cost for everybody because we can't coordinate that benefit. Can't do it with Medicaid, we can't do it with Medicare, and increasingly, we can't do it with your basic health insurance because the plans have gotten smart and excluded that. So with that, Henry, I'll uh, pass the mic on. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Pete. Thank you. And uh, to continue the uh, presentation on auto no-fault reform, uh, we have Mr. Tom Shields from uh, Care of the Coalition for Auto insurance reform who has a PowerPoint presentation. Is that correct? I think we do if we have somebody who can turn it on. Take it away. And in the meantime, well, while we're waiting, uh, again, if you have any questions, um, please uh, pass them along. Um, Bob will be collecting them. And also, as everybody, as uh, Gary's got one over here, and also, as everybody signed in, we had uh, a table full of uh, information. I encourage you, if you haven't picked any of that stuff up, to pick it up. I doubly encourage you to pick up the uh, medication form that I have. Uh, and I, I know I've said this before, but as a, as a paramedic, nothing is more important if you have to call 911 than to get your medical history, to know what kind of medications you're taking, what kind of uh, um, um, medical problems you have. So uh, if you're incapacitated, we know how to uh, properly treat you and let the doctor know when we get you to the hospital. And it's extremely important that we can find it. <laughs> so a lot of people have the list, you know, they got it tucked away in their wallet or in their purse, uh, but uh, you get that medical form, you put it on a refrigerator magnet, or you put it on your cupboard, so uh, when 911 gets there, they find it, and uh, it, it, trust me, it extremely, uh, it makes an extreme difference in the uh, uh, care that you get, and we wanna make sure that we uh, provide proper care. So um, having said that, okay, we're ready to go, thank you. Here is a microphone working. Oh, you got it. Is it? It's working. Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Shields, and I'm with the Coalition for Auto Insurance Reform. Pete and I actually had talked beforehand about splitting up this presentation so it wasn't Pete and repeat, but unfortunately, he already talked a lot about the legislation. But I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of it and talk about the reforms that are actually in front of the legislature that Representative Yanez and others will hopefully be voting on sometime in the near future in, in the State House. Uh, the Coalition for Auto Insurance Reform includes uh, companies, insurance companies that are members of, of Pete's organization, the ones that aren't members of his organizations are also involved with the coalition. It includes organizations like the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, Small Business Association of Michigan, NFIB, Michigan Insurance Agents, the Michigan Farm Bureau, all to working together trying to reform no-fault no insurance. Um, and and uh, there was a, a bill introduced uh, in, in the state senate to start this whole process off back in March or April uh, by Senator Hune. And uh, that bill is Senate Bill 248. And, and that bill, I think it's important to remember as we go through this process, is that it changes a lot. It's not, you know, we can talk about what's in this bill today, but it may not be in this bill tomorrow. But there's general intent here of the legislator and what they're trying to do, which I think has been pretty consistent overall as we've gone through this process. Uh, and if we looked at Senator Hughes' bill, I think he introduced it, and the next day before it even was taken up by committee, there was already a substitute. And then it went into the Senate committee, and it changed again, and it passed the Senate. And then it went to the, then it went to the uh, 
uh, went to the Senate floor, it changed again, and it passed the state Senate and was sent to the House. Went to the House Insurance Committee and they changed it some more. And, uh, and that's where it sits today. And we, we, uh, it is on the, the House floor of the Michigan House of Representatives to be taken up. And I am sure when it is taken up, and when they go, it'll change again as we go through this process. But as we've gone through this, I think the intent of the overall bill has been very consistent. And that the intent of the legislature to do this, and we didn't write this bill from the insurance industry. The, the, other, the opposition did not uh, write this bill. It was written by the legislature. And so we're all dealing with what they're certainly, we would certainly write a different bill if we could. Uh, but we uh, will we'll take the good with the bad, and, and, and we generally support uh, this bill because of what it does in the overall intent. And the overall intent is really is to protect no faults, unlimited medical benefits that are so, it's a wonderful benefit that they have in this state, is to protect that benefit, but at the same time, do something in order to make it cost less. Do something to try to, to bridge some of the costs that are in it so that the average driver in the state can, can, can afford auto insurance. And it's become unaffordable in this state, and we're trying to do something without affecting the number of benefits. So there's a number of provisions in this bill to do that, and uh, I'll go through those. What we try to do is look at some of the changes. As Pete mentions that when the bill was, when No Fault was passed some 40 years ago, things have changed since then. It's morphed into something that we wasn't really intended to do. So it ties to take a look at some of those things and some of those consequences that have happened from the, that morphing process and see if we can go back and fix some of those. One of those is a fraud bureau. And uh, Michigan is only one of eight states in the country that does not have a fraud bureau. And as you can imagine, with the most generous benefits in the country, that we are ripe for people trying to take advantage of that and commit fraud on this and try to cheat the system. And when they cheat the system, it, it raises the cost for everybody else. You all pay for that, and every one of you are in your, in your auto insurance for the bill every time. Every time somebody cheats the system, it costs all of you. It doesn't cost the insurance companies as much, it costs all of you because the rates just go higher. So we're trying to do something to that, and Senate Bill 7, 248 creates a fraud bureau for the first time in the state of Michigan. It's sort of complicated how it works, but basically uh, there's a, a pot of money that's put together, it's paid for by the insurance companies uh, at an average of about $2 a car, uh, and it puts money into specific efforts to fight fraud uh, in the auto insurance uh, in, in the auto insurance companies in, in, in the state. Uh, in New York, there was just an article in the paper a few weeks ago or a few months ago that talked about auto insurance fraud. They discovered a ring in New York that was 170 million dollars of of auto insurance fraud in the state of New York. And this is a, a state that only has fifty thousand dollars worth of medical coverage. Could you imagine what it is in the state of potentially what it is in the state of Michigan? You have unlimited medical coverage. There's an article in your packet we put out here that uh, um, talks about a fraud bureau that was that was a fraud effort that was discovered here in the Detroit area, um, and it's actually by the federal government. And the federal agents found this, and they filed a RICO suit. What you had is you had lawyers and medical personnel. Uh, and, and they were working together in order to find people who were in auto accidents but weren't necessarily getting any, any care at this point in time, convince them that they needed some care, bring them in, do five, six, seven treatments a day, and then bill the auto insurance companies at six times the rate of what they billed for Medicare payments, six times the rate. And the doctors, they still haven't been convicted of anything yet because they justify it saying that as doctors, we can choose how much care our patients should get. And there's nothing wrong with billing six times the Medicare rate. What that does is just raises all of your costs. And it goes to the point of this is one of the reasons why we need to address trying to get some control of the cost of Medicare. So the next one is trying to lower the cost. We try to set up, as Pete talked about, was a medical fee schedule. In this case, this has changed. This was initially was uh, the workers' compensation fee schedule. Now, as the bill currently sits, it's 150% of Medicare, which means that if you go in and get a, uh, uh, an x-ray uh, under, under Medicare, they're going to pay $100 and for, it's just it's an example, and if you are uh, an auto and accident payment, they will get $150 the hospital will get for that x-ray, which means they'll pay 50% more. That is huge savings on your, in your auto insurance bill. Right now, they, were billing, they are being billed at three, four, and five times the rate for that exact same x-ray. We will gladly take that. And as as it'll, it'll be a big savings in your auto insurance bill if we can get some type of simple medical fee schedule uh, involved uh, in, in auto insurance. Um, that 150 is slightly more than the average commercial policy pays. So it's slightly more than Blue Cross Blue Shield and some of the other ones pays. 
Uh, so it's not, it's, and those are, those are rates that are negotiated by the hospital, that's negotiated by these medical providers, and they accept those for everybody else, but at the same time, they're using the law, the little quirks in the law, in order to bill no fault at this point in time, um, three and 400 and 500 percent more than what they bill other people. So we're trying to just make it fair. We're not trying to cut it below. We're not trying to make sure they lose money. We're just trying to make it fair so that we can get some control over the overall costs of medical care. Secondly, what we try to do to lower costs is we talk about attendant care. Attendant care is the fastest growing cost under, the, um, under auto insurance medical care. About 40% of the MCCA costs, about $400 million a year, are paid out in attendant care. It's attendant care for either family members taking care of, of catastrophically injured patients or professionals taking care, but it is increasing more and more every day. And as you can see, as, as the system gets older, you know, the, the patients are getting older too, and most of that care is, you know, cost goes into attendant care. But in order to, to get some controls over the cost, we need to do something about attendant care. The legislature has decided. So what they have done is that they are going to decide to, that this bill limits attendant care to a total of 24 hours a day, which means that a, a patient can only have 24 hours of coverage that is paid for. They can have as much as they want, but it only be paid for at 24 hours in a day. And that could be 12 hours of family member watching them. It could be 12 hours of professional. 24 hours combined, any way, shape, or form is in this bill. If it is decided and if it's felt by the medical profession that they need more and additional care, there will be a medical board set up and they can go and get that additional care if they need that. But at this point in time, uh, the bill would, would limit that to 24 hours a day. Um, it would also reduce the amount that a family member is paid for general attendant care from whatever's currently in the system. And some actually are getting less than $15, but many are getting many more, much more than $15 an hour, but they can collect $15 an hour, and that'll be increased with the CPI every other year, um, or a maximum of $131,500 for a family member providing basic attendant care for a member of their family. If they are a professional, and, and, and then they would be paid at a professional rate. But if they are a family member, they would be limited to 131,500, which you think is a lot of money. But there are, there are many families who are collecting much more than that to take care of a family member who, was entered, who has a catastrophic injury into the system. And if they do that, if we do enact these costs, then the insurance companies will have to freeze the rates as of January 1st of 2016, the current auto insurance rates, and reduce those next June by $100 per car, or an average of about $200 per family, or a total savings of about $700 million uh, over, uh, per year for our Michigan auto, for Michigan drivers. This is about equivalent to what they're talking about, raising your taxes for the road. So um, it's, it's, but it's a significant amount of dollars. It's about 10% of the average insurance bill. Um, and it will automatically go in, and it goes in effect for a minimum of two years, uh, in effect. And after that, you know, the marketplace will, will, will take over. But it guarantees a two-year savings of about $200 per family and $100 per car. Lastly, as Pete talked about, is the MCCA. And this has been a bone of contention from both sides for years. Um, neither side really liked the MCCA. The people who want to keep the current system and oppose reforms uh, don't like the MCCA because it's run by the insurance industry. It's not transparent. Um, they're not receptive and they're not open to the public and, and they want to see changes to it. And there's lawsuits going on and it's all the way up to the Supreme Court at this point in time. The insurance industry, on the other hand, doesn't like necessarily the MCCA. They don't want to allow other people in because they're responsible for making sure those bills are paid. It's their liability. And since it's their liability, they don't want somebody from the public, they don't want somebody from, from uh, non-insurance industry making decisions of what goes on with those funds that are in the MCCA. They want to make sure those funds are there to pay for those people, uh, medical bills who have been uh, catastrophically injured. And so that in order to solve that problem, the legislature has come up with the idea of let's create a brand new MCCA a new Michigan catastrophic claims industry. And everybody who is newly injured as of the, after the first year would go into this new fund. And this fund would not be run by the insurance industry this time, it would be run as a public fund. And the board members would be appointed by the governor and approved by the, by the legislature, it would not include anybody from the insurance industry on this fund. 
and uh, the bills, the, the money would go into the fund and the bills would be paid directly from the fund. So you don't have to argue with insurance companies anymore. You, you submit your bills to the fund, the fund pays the bills. And those people who are sitting on the board are doctors and medical personnel and hospital personnel and drivers uh, and people who represent the general public would be serving on that board and making those decisions on who gets paid and who doesn't get paid. Those that are currently under the system, that today's system under the MCCA and are catastrophically injured would continue under the current system because it is the liability of the, of the uh, auto insurance companies to pay those bills and those bills would continue being paid throughout their lifetime until there was no more bills to pay, which could be 70, 80 years from now. But uh, those bills would be taken care of and there would be enough funds in there to take those people who are currently under the system. Um, there's a, a, a piece in your in folder I put out which goes through and compares the two, but it basically it operates the same way, but it takes the insurance companies out of it and it puts the public in control. It's open to FOIA, it's open to transparency, it's open to Open Meetings Act, the new MCCA, and hopefully that answers some of the questions and some of the problems that people have had overall with the MCCA. So overall, what Senate Bill 48 does, it's actually a fairly simple bill considering how complicated this issue is. It basically tries to put some reasonable cost controls in place. It tries to be, bring more transparency to the system by, by, by making the, uh, the new MCCA tra completely transparent. It provides lifetime medical, and it protects the lifetime medical benefits. You still get lifetime medical benefits as long as you are, if you are injured in an auto accident, it doesn't make any difference under the new MCCA or the old MCCA. And it tries to also put some reasonable cost controls in place so that on the short term, and especially the long term, we won't see the increases that we have in auto insurance over the last 40 years. Thank you very much, and we look forward to sitting on the panel and answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much for that presentation. And by the way, Tom, I, I heard that $700 million figure before. I'm not sure exactly where, but I think I saw it in a piece of literature once in my neighborhood. So um, anyways, so that's the presentation in regards to uh, why auto uh, no fault should be reformed. Now we're going to hear from the other side uh, and uh, representing CPAN, CPAN, I said, that, I keep saying C-SPAN, I don't know why. CPAN is, uh, is Mr. Steve Sinus who will give a presentation uh, representing the other side. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. I think what brings us all together is that we're trying to search uh, for the truth here about the, the no-fault reform debate, and the presenters have uh, presented facts and information to you for, for you to consider, and I'm going to give you some insight from my perspective as far as what I do for people and my job as a lawyer. I am a part of the legal counsel for the Coalition for Protecting Auto No-Fault, but my real job is to represent individuals and people who have been injured in a wide variety of ways, including auto accidents. So my uh, perspective today comes from representing those people and trying to explain to you some features of our system that I think really need some clarification. The one thing that I really want to bring up today, first and foremost, is the use of the word unlimited. I take great issue with this word. It is used and tossed around in the no-fault reform debate constantly by media and other people involved in the debate to say that we have this system of unlimited benefits. If the word unlimited is used to, to, to mean that there's no monetary cap or, or time limit on the, uh, for, for, for claiming benefits, then that word is appropriate. But if it's used to suggest that there is this constant faucet that people can go up to and just turn on and it pours out benefits and it pours out money forever, whoever wants it, that is completely untrue. And you can go to my file cabinets and you can see how many insurance companies I unfortunately have to bring lawsuits against because they deny people benefits. And they, de they deny people benefits on a number of features under the current law that exists. For example, you heard that no fault pays for what is, wh whatever is reasonably necessary for a person's care, recovery, or rehabilitation. I have countless cases against insurance companies that dispute the reasonable necessity of care. They hire doctors who do nothing but perform evaluations for insurance companies, and they deny people benefits, and then those people have no recourse other than to call me, unfortunately, to represent them. Likewise, the term uh, for the charge requirement that a, that a provider can charge a no-fault insurer is a reasonable charge. So this idea that medical expenses uh, incurred for auto accident care can be billed at whatever amount is untrue. 
In fact, the definition is that the medical provider can only bill a reasonable charge. So I also have many cases where the no-fault insurer is disputing whether the rate a medical uh, professional charges them is reasonable. The other thing about the reasonable charge requirement for you to understand is that most of you, I bet, if you go home and look at your insurance declaration page, you're going to see the word access next to the term personal injury protection insurance coverage or, or, or secondary or coordinated. What those words mean is that you have bought a policy for a cheaper premium so that your health insurance company has to pay first before you can turn to no fault. And what I want to tell you is that when you're in that situation and you have a coordinated no fault policy and you incur the hospital bill, that hospital has to take the rates from your health insurance company, which are usually reduced based on participating provider contracts, and that's all they can accept. They can't go ahead and charge the no-fault insurer the differential. So in that sense, everybody that has a coordinated no-fault policy, when you have to turn to your health insurance company first, the reduced rates under the health insurance contract are what apply. You see these maybe these billboards that say MRI under no fault, $3,000, under Medicaid, $400. There are instances where providers may take advantage of the reasonable charge requirement, and maybe rightfully so, the insurance companies have to hire lawyers to say, no, we're not paying that unreasonable rate. But when you really look at the reality of the situation, in a lot of instances, the, the rates that insurance companies actually pay for medical care, or the rates that are paid to providers for auto accident uh, related medical care are reasonable under the definition of the No Fault Act or at least fall under the preferred provider discount rates of health insurance contracts. So those are limitations. Those are reasons why we should say that the system is not unlimited. Moreover, what I want to tell you is that our Supreme Court in a number of cases over the last 15 years has ratcheted up those limitations. There's now a whole line of cases that dispute, that, that, that allow insurance companies to dispute whether a particular service or accommodation or product you may need as an injured person relates to your injuries. And I'm not going to lecture about these uh, complicated cases and, and the holdings that the Supreme Court has reached in these cases, but I can tell you that in the last 10 years, that definition of causal relationship between the injury and the service that someone's seeking has, becoming, is, has become much more difficult for injured people to pass. So when you talk about unlimited, this system is not unlimited. There are battles going on across the state between individuals and insurance companies about what should be paid. So I really wanted to emphasize that to show that this system is not something that is just raining money on people, and it's also one that's governed by reasonableness. So when the other side talks about reasonable cost measures, I can tell you that reasonableness is already part of the No Fall Act. The other thing I wanted to emphasize is that when it comes down to the reforms that we're talking about, you know, as you've caught on, there's, there, there's the SB 248 bill that deals basically with the cost of, of, of providers or the cost that providers can charge for uh, medical services, the fraud authority, the MC3, and there's also de-insurance. I, I want to make a few comments about SB 248. First of all, on the fraud authority, I will tell you that it offends me more than anyone else to hear about individuals pursuing fraudulent claims. I try to make a practice around pursuing legitimate claims, pursuing claims that should be pursued, and I know that there are instances, especially in the metro Detroit area, where people are abusing the system. I'll tell you that CPAN doesn't want any of that. They, they want to take a stand against it. And so, to the extent that SB 248 offers some type of regulation that will help limit those types of situations, we welcome it. But I will tell you that it is a one-way street based on the SB 248 bill. It does nothing to police the fraud and the misconduct that can occur on the insurance side of the equation. And I know that there are a lot of insurance companies that do the right thing and, and that stand behind their insurance, but unfortunately there are some that don't. And I also have several cases in my file cabinet where that's going on. And when you look at whether your legislators are doing the right thing to reform this system, you got to ask, why isn't that a two-way street? Why are the insurance companies being empowered to go more after the individual and not being in a position where they also can be examined, where we can also find out if they're treating their people in the right way and in a good faith fashion. So the fraud authority is something that CPAN doesn't necessarily have a problem with in concept. There are some details about how it's set up that we could talk a, a while about. But the biggest issue is that it is not a two-way street. The other thing I want to point out about the MC3 
is that, as you all know, we are forced to pay into this Catastrophic Claims Association fund. And I will tell you that that fund does amazing things for people. I have clients who are severely injured, whether it be paralysis or brain injury, and because of that fund, and because of the fact that we have paid into this reinsurance fund, there is enough money to cover their care and to give them some semblance of a quality life and so that their families can be kept intact, they can live at home, and it's a great thing to see those people get the benefit of, of, of that money. So we're all required to pay into that fund for that reason, to protect us and those around us who may be catastroph catastrophically injured. The thing about the current bill is that, yes, it does make improvements to the current MC3 or, or current MCCA in certain ways, but there is 19 to 20 billion dollars of our money sitting in this fund. That is higher than the GDP of several nations in this world. 19 to, 19 to 20 billion dollars that is sitting there. And when you want to know more information about what's going on with that money, the MCCA doesn't necessarily want to talk about it. And that is evidenced by the fact that there is a case that was brought by CPAN and the Brain Injury Association against the MCCA based on the Freedom of Information Act that has gone all the way to the Supreme Court. And it's sitting there. And the Freedom of Information Act request asks for information about the rate making data, asks for information about all the numbers that go into the rates they charge us as Michigan motorists. And the MCCA said, no thank you, we are not subject to FOIA, we're not giving you that information. The trial court said, yes, you do have to give them the information. When we have this system of insurance that we all have to participate in, then we need to know whether our rates are fair. It's, essential to, it's essentially like a tax. If the government wouldn't tell you how they're taxing you, you'd be outraged. Th th this is essentially a tax that we all have to pay, and the MCCA was saying, no, we're not going to give you that information. The Court of Appeals gave them a victory. The Court of Appeals reversed the trial court and said, no, they're not subject to FOIA. But what I want you guys to know is that that case is pending before the Supreme Court and that the MCCA doesn't want to give that information. Now, could it be that that information shows nothing of any significance? Possibly. But when somebody doesn't want to give you something, you have to assume that maybe they're hiding something. So I will tell you that this 19 to $20 billion sitting in that fund is money that we don't really have an understanding of how it's being used and how our rates are being assessed going forward. The other thing I'll point out about the bill, and this is a little bit technical, but I'll try to break it down in general terms. If that new entity is created, the MC3, and this old one is dissolved, if there's a surplus in the MCCA, the old entity, under the current way it's set up, that surplus goes back to the members of the MCCA. The members are the insurance company. There's nothing in this bill that says necessarily that any money left over in the MCCA, once it's, once it's dissolved, goes back to the individuals. It very well could be swooped up by the insurance companies. I'm not trying to say that that's how they're trying to construct this bill, but there's no protection in the bill for that issue, and that's a real concern. If we've all paid into this system and there's billions sitting in there, it should go back to the people of Michigan in some way or another. The other issue I want to talk about with SB 248 has to do with the back to the reasonable charge requirement. I know that some of the previous presenters uh, talked about health care costs and how they're rising in our nation. They are, and that's an issue. But we have to understand what SB 248 tries to do is as its fee schedule, in its current form, it says that providers can be paid no more than 150% of Medicare. Now, because so many of us are on Medicare and because we're so used to hearing about Medicare, that might sound like a good deal. That is not a good deal for providers. Providers will tell you of, of high-level trauma centers and other uh, high-level health care providers that if they had to make their margin on 150% of Medicare for all patients they treated, they would not have the type of, uh, type of technology and the good level of, of, of services they have from their medical professionals. They simply wouldn't have enough money to provide that type of service. So 150% of Medicare really is not going to cut it. The idea of having a fee schedule, as long as it provides for the type of compensation that is really reasonable, going back to the reasonable standard, is something that CPAN is, 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 is uh, willing to entertain. And in, in fact, it has presented amendments to offer a, a, a different form of fee schedule that pays something significantly higher than 150% of Medicare, but it at least goes back to trying to have some certainty within the system to improve it. So those are my essential points about SB 248. 
But I also wanted to mention something about the insurance. We all think that the insurance is Detroit's problem. That, that's something that, hey, if Detroit wants that, let's give it to them. If they can't afford their insurance, why do we care? We don't live in Detroit. We live in Sterling Heights. We live in Dearborn. We live wherever outside of Detroit. Let the people of Detroit have that. I will tell you, and this, I don't want to get too theoretical here, but if you allow a whole sector of our state to be carved out of a compulsory insurance system that is based on the idea that everyone's going to insure themselves for their medical care, if you do that, the system will inevitably crumble. And that's because you won't have people who are injured in accidents down in Detroit able to get their own coverage. The de-insurance bill caps their medical benefits, their entire family's medical benefits, at $25,000. The, the current bill that is, is, is under, uh, it, that is in its proposed form actually says it's an aggregate cap. So if a family of four are in an auto accident, they all are subject to this $25,000 cap. There is an exception to that cap that says if your life is on the line, you have $250,000 to get your life stabilized, but once your life's stabilized, that $250,000 goes away and you're back to the 25. In a nutshell, it's essentially virtually worthless coverage if you're in a serious accident because you're gonna pay for it within three hours in the hospital and you're gonna blow through the coverage and you're not gonna have anything. So query, what happens to somebody, a pedestrian, a little girl playing in the street in Detroit who's hit by a drunk driver? Well, under the insurance, she is only going to have up to $25,000 for her medical care, and then she's going to say, you know what, I want to go sue that at-fault driver for the rest of my medical benefits. Well, as the person from DIFS presented, our system is based on the idea of immunizing the at-fault driver for medical care. So we all live in a state where we know that we're not going to be sued for millions if we make a mistake and, and hit somebody. But in that situation, under the de-insurance, uh, bill, that little girl's not going to have any source of payment for her medical bills. She's going to have to sue the at-fault driver. So anybody who travels into the city of Detroit is going to be facing the possible exposure for paying other people's medical bills if they make a mistake and hit somebody with the insurance. There are other ways in which the system will crumble under the insurance based on equal protection. If, if the insurance passes, and somebody in, in Flint or another city wants to have that type of discounted policy, they're going to file a lawsuit and say, hey, why can't I get that policy? I want to pay less for my auto insurance. Why do people of Detroit get that kind of treatment? I want the same thing. And eventually, it'll spread like wildfire. And eventually, you'll be in a state that'll have that problem of wanting to go after the at-fault driver for medical care because we're going to have these significant limited caps on people's auto accident coverage. So de-insurance is not just a, a, a bad deal for the people of Detroit, which I think it definitely is. It is the type of insurance policy I could never recommend anybody buying if I knew them or if I didn't know them. It is terrible coverage, and that, maybe that's my opinion, but I will tell you that if you look down at the specifics of that bill and what it covers, $25,000 cap, the insurance companies get to pick their, the, the doctors you treat with, you got to get pre-authorization from the insurance company to get the treatment. It is seriously limited coverage. So it's a type of coverage that the people of Detroit don't want to have, but it's also the type of coverage for all the problems I identified that the people of Michigan don't want to have. In closing, what I really want to emphasize is that this system is a good one overall. It does amazing things for people. It protects us from the potential liability in the event that we actually hit somebody. And these other things that we can talk about are all have to do with improvements have to do with making sure that nobody's committing fraud, that, that there is more certainty with the claims processing end of things. And on that note, some of the amendments offered by CPAN are, are along the lines of making sure that adjusters handle our claims properly. Because unfortunately, I will tell you that there are so many adjusters out there that don't handle it properly. There are a lot that do, but there are a lot of clients I have that twist in the wind, waiting to get their wage loss checked, waiting to get their medical bills paid, and the proposed reforms do nothing to help that problem. So if the people of Michigan want to make a difference here and demand something from their legislators, improve it on all sides. Improve it for everybody. Thank you.